when I say, who are you, you say, who am I? Who are you? Who am I? Who are you? Who am I? It's an age-old question that humans have asked themselves. Who am I? Who am I? It's a simple yet deep question, one that re requires reflection on identity, values, beliefs, and experiences. You are who you are. But is who you are who you truly are? I get paid to ask people these questions every day. It's true, you are certainly more than your name and your job title. Us humans love to judge, right? Yeah. yeah. We often judge ourselves and others brutally. And therefore, this can lead to misconceptions. Something that I know plenty about having to break. No, this is not a onesie. <laughs> I'm not a musician. <laughs> I don't smoke weed all day. <laughs> I am a professional. And I do wash under my armpits and wash my locks. I've been called a Trustafarian, a Wigger, a wannabe. People on the streets regularly heckle me, casting judgment without even having a conversation with me. Some even have the audacity to come and touch my locks without asking. On the flip side, I get hailed as emperor, lion, king, brother. Strangers come up to me and give me love and respect. It's easy to idealize authenticity. Being an outlier has its pros and its cons. Everyone seems to have an opinion, but not everyone has empathy. What if we could have a true understanding of people's position in that place and time? What if we cultivated compassion, kindness, respect? The world would be a better place with more empathy and less opinions. A deep human desire is to belong and feel secure. And I've certainly faced the downside of rejection and enjoyed the upside of acceptance. From learning to walk in Canada to my first memory in South Africa, pivotal experiences in Zimbabwe and in, in my adult life, living and working as a global nomad across six different regions of the world, a pattern emerged of being amongst people and cultures that I wasn't born into, yet being accepted. It's been an incredibly privileged position as I've become deeply immersed in different social cultural contexts. My own understanding of self, identity and perspective grew and evolved. In anthropology, our research method is ethnography. You become a participant observer in a particular group for a minimum of one year. I've done these studies over several years with the Rastafari community in Africa and the UK, in the Japanese Mahayana Buddhist uh, order, and with plant medicine shamans. I soaked in the experiences, I participated in the practices, and I gathered stories and insights. I use these skills and experiences in the commercial world to help people to understand and establish their own understanding of self and position. What I've learned is it's okay to not fit in. On the whole, people will admire and respect you. Doesn't mean you won't be accepted. Actually, by not conforming or going against the grain, helps you to realize and live out your differentiator, your uniqueness, which on the whole people will admire and respect. Why is it the ones that are truest to themselves seem to be judged the hardest? People question, are they the real deal? By standing out, you often become a target and people can mislabel you, label you, and you have to justify yourself. So get this, this is a true story. A client that never met me told my business partner, Ryan, I wasn't a good fit for our brand. He judged me on my dreadlocks. He judged me on my clothes. He judged me on my spiritual beliefs. So what did Ryan do? He stepped in, 
set the record straight, put me on the plane, sent me overseas, and that guy soon changed his opinion. Ironically, I ended up supporting him, manage his own reputation. <laughs> the thing is, some people don't understand that my appearance mirrors my beliefs, that my profile mirrors my life. The thing is, I don't want to be inauthentic. And despite experiencing imposter syndrome when I transitioned from a 20-year career in humanitarian work to the commercial world, I discovered that people actually admire and respect that authenticity. I'm not going to lie to you. I was worried I was going to be rejected. But the truth is, it's rarely been a problem. And if it ever is, I approach it in two ways. One, it's a chance to win them over. And two, we're not aligned. And that's OK. I don't feel the need to be loved by everybody. As the saying goes, if you want to lead the orchestra, you have to be willing to turn your back on the crowd. For too long, we've struggled to conform to the working world and wider societal pressures. It seems like only now we are realizing we can create our own working world, one that reflects who we truly are. And it's my hope that this breakthrough can become more prevalent in the world of social media and wider society. It's easy to judge. It's hard to be empathetic. Yes, I don't look like a business leader to most people. I've been judged on that many times, but I've learned to deal with it. My differences, they're my strength. They come from my story, the places I've traveled, the people that I've met, my own deep awareness of my own self. It's incredibly liberating being true to who you are, but warning folks, it's not for the faint hearted. Chip Conley serves us up an uh, equation for authenticity. It goes like this. Authenticity equals self-awareness times courage. So in order to know who you are, in order to be true to who you are, you have to know who you are. And then you have to have the bravery to be it. So the start point is self-awareness. The key is to gain clarity and confidence in who you are and then how to show up. In order to do this consistently, add highly effective emotional intelligence to the mix. Are we together? Yeah? yeah? Nice. In anthropology, what we believe is that culture and identity is fluid. When I was a youth, I abused alcohol. I got a taste for it young. I was known for it in my hometown and the spicy temperament that it came with. When I was 18, I went back to Africa in the search to land my dream career job in international development. I got deeply involved in local groups in Zimbabwe and Kenya, and then bang, a pivotal moment occurred, a near-death experience with malaria. It was incredibly sobering, literally. As the parasites ate through my red blood cells and my internal organs began to fail, I made a plea to the Most High God, Jah, Creator, Universal Power, whatever you want to call it, I begged for another chance on this earth. And if that was to be granted, then a clear commitment from me that I was going to make certain changes in my life. So by the time I came back to the UK, I wasn't the same guy. People said, you've changed. Damn straight I've changed, <laughs> because I wanted to, and I became aware that I needed to, because the thinking, the beliefs, the behaviours that I had weren't serving me, and they certainly weren't going to get me to where I wanted to go. Who I was wasn't going to be who I was always going to be. W.E.B. Du Bois beautifully puts it like this. Be ready at any moment to give up what you are for what you might become. We evolve. However, certain elements remain constant. These are usually related to do with our nature and our gifts and talents. What and who has shaped and influenced your character, your personality, the way you think, 
feel and behave. Identity is a construct, by the way. It's shaped by our socialization, all of our skills, habits, and beliefs. It's socialization that teaches us how to fit into society. The famous sociologist Giddens describes it as the process that a helpless baby undergoes to become self-aware, knowledgeable, and skilled in the culture in which they are born, which is ultimately how we acquire beliefs, habits, and skills that we need to play an appropriate role in society. It's our family, peer group, community, formal education system, mass media, religion, that all contribute to the process of our socialization. And it doesn't end at childhood. It adapts and adjusts according to context as we navigate new communities, new jobs, and emerging trends. As we develop and grow within these different socialization experiences, we develop and construct a sense of our own identity. I'd like us to take a moment to reflect, a moment of introspection. But before we get there, I'm going to tell you a story. I've traveled to many places and done pilgrimages in Ethiopia, Kenya, Peru, and India. I fasted for days on end to go deeper into introspection. I examined my own beliefs and values and behaviors in search for my higher self. I trekked to and prayed in sacred places. I drank plant medicines to journey deeper into myself in order to connect to the source, attempting to move away from ego, suffering, attachment, and shed my social cultural baggage. I learned that I'm not my thoughts. I learned that I cannot be defined by my possessions. I learned that we are feeling beings that think, not thinking beings that feel. I learned that people think culture is their friend when it's often their enemy. As they say in Kenya, you're born with nothing and you die with nothing. I lost a family member recently as I looked at her dead body, she was gone. She wasn't there anymore. It was a shadow of who she was. At the funeral, there was no mention of material successes or what she did for a job. It was all about her energy, her spirit, her character, her impact, what she gave to others. Let's leave something beautiful behind. A Buddhist monk once told me, just like shells, we can adorn the world after we're gone. Right, let's get back to that introspection. Let's bring it back to you and let's practice some of the stuff that we've been talking about. Let's take a moment to reflect pause and think about who you are because when you know who you really are you can be free so as we close our eyes and we take a deep breath in and out ask yourself over and again what experiences people and events have shaped who you are and let the answers flow Let's go. You have to be brave to dig deep to discover your true self. It's hard to look in the mirror. It's easy to look away. There are so many things to unlearn, 
so many layers to penetrate, like peeling back an onion. And it's hard because we don't create that time for introspection and reflection. When I see amazing people going under the radar, or not shining in certain arenas, I wish they could see themselves like how I see them. If this sounds like you, ask for feedback. Gauge from a broad range of people how they perceive you. And when you pick up on those characteristics, embrace them, own them. This can help you to arrive at a place of peace, knowing that your value is being shared with others. You are here for a reason. You have been chosen. The promise over your life is your gifts and talents. Use them to the fullest. If you're strategic, position yourself to use it. If you're a harmonizer, position yourself to use it. If you're an encourager, position yourself to use it. This may seem countercultural to the pressures that you face to live other people's dreams and not your own, and it takes bravery to overcome those pressures. But you must remember, you are enough, more than enough, always enough. You have gifts and talents. You have a purpose. Your life is sacred. When you realize why you are here, and live it out wholeheartedly, you can walk in beauty and live a meaningful and fulfilling life. Imagine a world where you are brave enough to stay true to who you really are. Now, I want to appreciate you in a Kenya style and fashion. We call it a kamoja. Kamoja in Kiswahili means once. Okay, so can everyone prepare like this? Okay, this is because you're wonderful. I want you first and foremost to appreciate yourself and then all of the other beautiful human beings in the world. You're going to follow my lead. Hey, guys, the timing was awful. Are you, was it that bad I put you to sleep? I put you to sleep all... Right, let's go.